All right, and we back on the forecast. Now, if we spend half of the energy that we use trying to be accepted by a system designed to hurt us into building our own system designed to protect us, then we would be in a lot better situation. We run to go put our cape on to fight in every single war for America, fighting and defending the freedom of America. Then when it's time to fight for ours, far too many of us get scared and want to leave it up to everything and everybody else but ourselves. Some of us think that if we join the system, we'll be exempt. They will somehow see you different from the rest of us. No matter what you believe, they see us all as the same. And then they brainwash us to see each other through the eyes of this system and judge each other with a white supremacist standard. And some even go out and enforce white supremacy on others. In Connecticut, a 19-year-old unarmed black woman, Stephanie Washington, was shot in the face and the back by Hamden police while she was just sitting in the car with her boyfriend. So let's go back and see how this young woman, Stephanie Washington, ended up getting shot in the face and the back. Shots fired, Argyle Street, with the car, with the car. Roger, shots fired. 20, what's your location? Argyle Street. Argyle Street, Dixville, 093. Turning now to developing news in New Haven, body cams were improperly used and in one case not used at all. That's the conclusion from state police today as the investigation into the police shooting at an unarmed couple in New Haven continues. Now the calls for the officers involved to be fired are growing louder. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Matthew Campbell is live at Hamden Police Headquarters with a closer look at that video. And Matthew, what can you tell us tonight? Well, Aaron, it shows several lapses in judgment by these officers. The state says the Hamden officer did not have his body camera on until after the initial shots were fired. The Yale officer did not turn his body camera on at all. Now, you may be wondering about dash cam footage. That technology does not exist here in Hamden Cruisers. Yale has it, but again, the state says the officer simply did not turn it on. This is body cam video released by state police today showing Hamden officer Devin Eaton fire several shots toward Paul Witherspoon's red Honda Civic as the door opens. The camera was turned on after Eaton fired the initial shots, but there's a recall function on it which allowed the footage to be played back. But there's no audio for this portion. In a perfect world, without all those stressors, yes, you should have put, turned it on much sooner. Yesterday, Eyewitness News was the first to show you this clearer version of surveillance, which some say shows Witherspoon exiting the car with his hands up. There are indications that he was told to open the door, yes. Or come out with his hands up. James Ravella is the commissioner of the Department of Emergency Services, and he says there's no video available from Yale officer Terrence Pollock because he failed to turn on both his body camera and dash camera. This shooting, which did injure Witherspoon's girlfriend, stems from an investigation into a reported armed robbery that happened here at the Goan gas station in Hamden. A clerk called police saying a man matching the description of Witherspoon robbed a delivery person at gunpoint. Attention all units, attention all units. Hamden just put out that there was a street robbery involving a firearm, a gun. That led to Eaton crossing city lines into New Haven looking for the suspect. No gun was found in the car and Witherspoon was not charged. We went back to the gas station today and was told all surveillance had been turned over to police and the clerk who dialed 911 no longer works there. Police officers are not supposed to act as judge, jury and executioner on our street. Since the shooting, Carrie Ellington has organized marches at Hamden Police Headquarters and Yale and says today's development makes her more motivated to see swift discipline for the officers involved. 
These officers should be suspended without pay right now, and they should be terminated as soon as possible. We took those demands to Hamden Mayor Kurt Ling. The officer will be held accountable for his actions, and the actions weren't acceptable. Now, the state says releasing the body camera footage while the investigation is still going on is very rare, but they did that because they want to be transparent. Now, the state's attorney's office is handling this investigation, and these things take months, sometimes up to a year to be completed, but we learned tonight that's also being fast-tracked. This investigation could be completed in two, possibly three months. Now, the police said they got a call after a newspaper delivery driver got robbed at a gas station, and Stephanie Washington's boyfriend... Paul Witherspoon fit the description, and his car fit the description. So then Officer Devin Eaton, who was a black cop, responded to the call, then crossed city lines out of his jurisdiction, where he saw this black couple sitting in a red car in a whole different area from where the robbery happened. And as he stopped him, according to the police, the cop Devin Eaton told his brother to get out of the car, but said he refused. Instead, he said his brother got out of the car in an abrupt manner and turned towards the cops. He's saying he told him to get out of the car and he refused, he just got out of the car too fast. And the video shows him getting out of the car with his hands up like he was told. Even a city official said he told him to get out of the car with his hands up, which he did. And this cop Devin Eden immediately jumped out of his car, opening fire, shooting his gun while he was running away. Then another black cop, Thomas Paula, with the Yale police, who didn't even turn his camera on at all, jumped out of his car while it was still moving and started to open fire. He actually hit his fellow officer he was there to back up. And it turns out this black couple didn't have a gun in the car at all. These cops were just shooting at each other. They fired all them shots but didn't hit this brother one time who was their target. But they did hit his girlfriend Stephanie Washington in the head and the back. Even if this brother Paul Witherspoon would have been the right person, which he wasn't, this sister Stephanie Washington still would have been an innocent passenger who had nothing to do with the robbery. And this brother said she was just sitting there screaming, they shot me, they shot me. And then after these cops shot at each other and hit this young woman, Stephanie Washington, then they arrested this brother, Paul Witherspoon. Now the police have been doing a little bit of caping, but with these black cops, that Blue Lives Matter rhetoric isn't quite the same. Imagine all those bullets going through that car and you doing nothing wrong. You're putting your hands out. You see it in the video, he has his hands out. Two officers are on leave after a police shooting in New Haven, but family and activists say that is not good enough. Channel 3 is learning that Stephanie Washington, the woman in the car, is out of the hospital. Meanwhile, Paul Witherspoon walked away unharmed. Channel 3's Shantae Passmore is live with what watchdog groups are saying they want done. Shantae? Denise, in recent days, activists have been calling for more transparency and better training. And right now, they're looking for action, and that's to fire the officers. Paul Witherspoon's mom, Keisha Green, holds her son tighter. Like, people thought he was dead. Like, they was putting rest in peace, Shady. He was a driver sitting in a car when state police say Hamden officer Devin Eaton and Yale officer Terrence Pollock fired their guns. Stephanie Washington also sat in a car struck by bullets. As a mother cares for her son, the Greater New Haven NAACP chapter keeps a closer eye on the police shooting. This was a big fail, and so this is going to be used as an example of what not to do. Chapter President Dory Dumas told Channel 3 the hospital released Stephanie Washington today. It's this body cam video released by state police that's left the NAACP stunned. The conduct is just, it's just disgusting. The way those police officers handled the whole situation, everything about it is wrong. It shows Hamden officer Devin Eaton fired several shots. He turned his camera on after he started shooting. State police say there's no recording from Yale officer Terrence Pollock because he didn't turn on his body nor dash cam. Meanwhile, the commissioner of Department of Emergency Services say there appears to be some indication Witherspoon was told to open the door and come out with his hands up. Hands up! Don't shoot. Clergy from New Haven laid out 10 reasons to fire Eaton and Pollock immediately. It said protocol was never followed. And to say that you are going to wait until the investigation is over, we're sending a message today. You will not wait. We will not wait. The urgency now. Yes, is now. 
And not only is this NAACP chapter worried about the New Haven shooting, but also the one we recently saw in Weathersfield. I've learned the chapters in Hartford and New Haven are working together to talk with state officials about these shootings. Now, these cops have been put on leave, but the Blue Lives Matter crowd isn't making as much noise as they usually make. The police themselves say they rarely release body camera footage, especially when they're still investigating. We usually always hear, we gotta wait for the facts. But in this case, they have no problem releasing it. They usually drag out the investigation until the anger calms down and then send it to a secret grand jury. But with these cops, they're gonna speed up the investigation, put it on a fast track. And what usually takes a year, they're gonna do in a month or two. And even the mayor has no problem in this case coming out saying this is unacceptable and these cops will be held accountable. And they do need to be held accountable, but they all need to be held accountable, not just certain ones. Too many think that having on a uniform or serving the very people who have been brutalizing you for hundreds of years will make you exempt and give you a pass from being brutalized. Too many people think it makes them different. But time and time again, you're always the first person they throw under the bus. Just because it's a black face doing it doesn't mean it's not racially profiling. A black person seeing another black person through the eyes of white supremacy is still white supremacy. Because somehow black cops never seem to make this mistake when it comes to white kids. When a white father put his own son in danger getting into a police chase, it was the black cop that got 40 years because the white kid ended up dead. There is a reason why black cops don't make the same mistake when it comes to other groups, because other groups will make that black cop pay. And sooner or later, you will get your wake up call. Just like what happened to the black woman, Sergeant Kai Waters. Okay, so if you notice, in this side of the screen, that's my white BMW, and that's her and her gray Nissan Altima. The same woman whose paint for her car is on the bumper of my car. So you're going to see me pull up here and I'm about to open my door and get out and go in the gas station where there's witnesses. Before I even have time to do anything, you see this woman run around to my car, go inside, start attacking me, literally. And then you see me run away from her multiple times and she's still coming after me as I'm telling her to back up. Remind you, the whole time I'm on the phone with law enforcement, with the 911 operator. Kentucky self-defense law. A lot of you have been asking, how does that work after our story last night involving a case of road rage in Elizabethtown that was caught on video? Wave 3 News reporter Connie Leonard took a look at the Castle Doctrine. She joins us now live with more. Now, this law allows deadly force if someone comes into your home or your car while you're in it. Yeah, Shannon, if you fear serious bodily harm from that person, the law is designed to protect you and anyone else who defends themselves. Attorney Tom Clay, who's not involved in the case, saw the surveillance video and says he believes it speaks for itself. The video certainly should have been taken into consideration in any charging decision. Louisville attorney Tom Clay says when he saw this gas station surveillance video, he was pretty certain he was witnessing the Castle Doctrine. Clay says it also appears police got it wrong when they charged 33-year-old Fort Knox Sergeant Kai Waters with felony assault. This video is very disturbing as far as showing a person who has been designated as a victim who actually appears to be the aggressor. Waters told us a 58-year-old woman got behind her in the fast lane on Patriot Parkway in February, wanting her to move over. Waters says the woman bumped her car, so she called 911 and pulled into a gas station. The woman pulled in behind her. She ran over to my vehicle, pretty much slammed the door on me, and I told her, I was like, you know I'm on the phone with the 911 operator, they can hear you. Waters claims the woman punched her face, so she grabbed a knife in her car and stabbed the woman's leg. The fight spilled outside. Waters said when Elizabethtown police arrived, they tended to the other woman and took her downtown. 
The Castle Doctrine got a lot of publicity in Louisville years ago when a judge ruled former Louisville baseball player Isaiah Howes was acting in self-defense when he shot and killed Daniel Covington after he said Covington attacked him in his car. Clay says in this case, there's video evidence. And this vehicle, which is a subject of this road rage incident, was occupied by the sergeant at the time this other individual came around and basically initiated physical contact with her. Now, Clay says Waters is entitled to immunity under the law. The prosecutor tells me tonight the grand jury will be given all the facts to make an informed decision. Now, this black woman, Kai Waters, is a sergeant in the military, and we know how much America respects his veterans. And she ended up getting into a road rage incident with a random white woman. She even hit Kai Waters' car, so she pulled into the gas station to call the cops. This white woman was calling her all kinds of racist names and then followed her into the gas station. And then this white woman got out of her car, opened Kai Waters' door, got in her car, and started attacking her. So Kai Waters defending herself as she should. When they attack one of us, they need to know that they're not going to leave there unharmed. They need to know it's going to be consequences when you try to hurt one of us. So after this white woman started punching her, Kai Waters took her military knife and stabbed her in the leg. When the police got there, they didn't ask any questions. They just arrested this black woman, Kai Waters. They didn't even ask her side of the story and started tending to the white woman. This woman, Kai Waters, was on the phone with 911 while she was being attacked. And she was in uniform and they still arrested her and made this random white woman who started the whole thing the victim. And now this black woman, Kai Waters, got to fight the charges and she might lose her job and other things. Now, Kentucky has a law called the Castle Doctrine which is something like the stand your ground laws. A white boy who was a baseball player, Isaiah Howes, shot and killed a brother Daniel Covington in another road rage incident. This white boy was not arrested, he was not charged, it was never sent to a grand jury. He used the castle doctrine and said it was self-defense. And with no evidence whatsoever, they took his word for it. But with this woman, Kai Waters, she has video evidence, she was on the phone with 911 and she still got charged. That's because these laws was never meant to help us, only hurt us. Most of the laws America has ever passed is only meant to justify us being killed. Now, this sister Kai Water suffered from severe Stockholm Syndrome. She was one of these Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter people. She talked about what about black on black crime, compare Black Lives Matter to the KKK. She even said she's tired of seeing her brothers and sisters in blue being murdered over stupidity. But now she see how our brothers and sisters in blue feel about her. And no matter what you try to do, you can't escape being black. Sooner or later, you're gonna get your nigga wake up call. And some feel like we shouldn't care for people with that mindset. But at the end of the day, she still had this experience because she was black. And it could happen to any one of us next time. If you destroy the system, you destroy that mentality. And if we keep letting outsiders punish our own, we're gonna continue to have the same results. If somebody like Jane Elliott or somebody white people would consider a turncoat would to ever be killed or hurt by a black person, the dominant society is not gonna say, well, that's what she get. I'm not gonna do anything about it. No, they're gonna punish whoever did it. They may try to make her an example or a lesson and say, this is what happened when you have this mindset, but they're gonna make sure that they punish that person because they know they could be next. It's a slippery slope. And until we start punishing outsiders as well as our own, we're going to continue to be subject to somebody else's rules, laws, and punishments. At the end of the day, we are all we got. And when we understand that, then we'll really be able to use our power. Yeah, I'm not lying, right? I'm not lying. But she's... Look, look, look. Am I lying? Look, she has no clothes on. Yes, get her dressed right now. Why would you come outside with this little girl and she don't got no clothes on? She didn't even have, she did not even have that on. She had a diaper on. It's too cold for that. But they're, they're clothed. This woman is talking about this little girl is crying because I'm yelling. No, she's cold. Because she didn't have no goddamn clothes on. This woman brought her down the block with a diaper on. Come on, what the fuck is y'all talking about? Yes, I am cursing, I am loud. Because you talking about that little girl is crying because I'm yelling. All right, and your children are dressed, though. I'm scared because that little girl ain't had no clothes on. Would you please stop? No, I will not. I will not. I will not.
I will not. Yep, I don't care. My name is Daryl Palmer, 1207 Christian Street. That little girl was outside with a diaper on. And that lady just sat down and started putting clothes on it. You talking about me? You got some goddamn nerve. This is gentrification, people. This is gentrification. Look at my fucking eyes. Yes, I'm yelling in front of these little white children and this little girl who was outside in 50 degree weather with just a diaper on. That's real, bro. I ain't do nothing wrong. This little girl just got clothes put on just now. Was outside with just a diaper on. This lady brought her outside with just a diaper on. That's bullshit. Ain't no thank you nothing. This woman right here brought this little girl down the block with just a diaper on. No, okay, yeah, you too. You are contributing to that. Fuck you talking about. Oh, right, bro, bro. You right, you right. This, let, let it go. It's, come on. It's, uh, you right. You absolutely right. I got a fucking okay, child. All right, it's cool, bro. How come dare on. you say that? All right, come on. She's yelling because she's she, she, she okay. crying because I'm yelling. Okay. No, she's crying because she's fucking cold. Okay, come on. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Not all white men make the same as every white man in a job. It's diversified across the board. It's just not a given that anybody is going to be making the same. It doesn't matter if you're a white man or a purple man, and you all know that numbers can, make, can say whatever you want them to say. I know you, it's not going to come to any surprise that I'm going to be voting no on this resolution. And that's because I feel so much anger in this resolution, but I'm not sure where it's directed. And that's what I'm having a problem with. I'm not mad at anybody. I don't feel cheated. I feel blessed. But here we get up and rant and rave over something that I'm not sure I agree with all the numbers. And I know that in my family, the Mexicans, the Native Americans, the Chinese, the Muslim, the Jews, they're all making what they can. And they, we've never talked about somebody being paid more than another for doing a job. It's never entered in, man, woman. We all work hard and we all feel blessed. And I just can't take part in something that is so focused against a white man. Because frankly, I feel white men have done a lot for this country and for this legislature, as all men have. And I want to thank them. Also, when you look at life expectancy, there are certain um, there are problems in a black race. Um, sickle cell anemia is something that comes up. Um, diabetes is uh, something that's prevalent in the genetic makeup and you just can't help it. Um, although I gotta say, I've never had better barbecue and better chicken and ate better in my life than when you go down south and you I mean, I love it, and everybody loves it. Um, the Mexican diet uh, in Mexico with all of the fresh vegetables, and you go down there and they're much thinner than they are up here. They change their diet. I believe, Representative Fields, you had your hand up as well. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I, and I don't have a, uh, a question for you, but I do have a comment. And uh, the uh, title, or of this committee is economic, develop, economic Opportunity and Poverty Reduction. And one of the things that I will not tolerate is racist and insensitive remarks about African Americans, the color of their skin, what you mentioned that we eat. I was highly offended by your remarks. And I will not engage in um, a dialogue where I'm in the company where you are using the stereotype references 
well, about African Americans and chicken and food and all those kinds of things. I will just not tolerate that. This is not what this committee is all about. And so I was asked that you suspend your perceptions and your judgment about African Americans, about poverty, and what we're trying to do is to come up with meaningful solutions. And it's not about chicken. This no. is not about eating chicken. A Broomfield fifth grader got kicked out of the Cub Scouts for asking a local politician a few tough questions. Cub Scout mom Lori Mayfield captured the discussion between Senator Vicki Marble and this Cub Scout group last week. Her son, Ames, asks the senator about controversial remarks she made in 2013 regarding blacks, fried chicken, and poverty. Then why do you specifically black people? I get that was made up by the media. So you want to believe it? You believe it. But that's not how it went down. I didn't do that. Well, that was false. Get both sides of the story. The senator's recollection apparently rusty. We asked the senator about the racially charged comments at the time. Do you think you were reinforcing stereotypes? That's the question. No, I don't think so. The senator attempted to elaborate on her comments at the scout meeting last week. Because I have blacks in my family. I have blacks and Mexican, and we talk about our genetics. A veteran officer told a police recruit to shoot black people, then tried to keep it quiet. WDRB's Valerie Chin uncovers exactly what the former prospect assistant police chief said and how his words came back to harm him. This is still a developing story. WDRB just obtained pages of disturbing racist and sexually explicit Facebook messages between Todd Shaw and the recruit. They all came in light while prosecutors were investigating another case. But his words created a firestorm of controversy. Uh, first, that the people in this community uh, realize that anyone who shares such blatant uh, racist views should not be given a badge or a gun or a position of authority in this community. Memes showing an Elmer Fudd with a gun and a racial slur and another one showing a boy with a disability wearing a shirt with a racial slur. Jefferson County Attorney Mike O'Connell uncovered them in private Facebook messages between former Assistant Prospect Police Chief Todd Shaw and an LMPD recruit. It's probably the most disgusting thing I've seen come out of the mouth of a police officer. The response to another message from the recruit asking what to do if he caught juveniles smoking marijuana, F the right thing if they're black, shoot them. Then he suggests having sex with a juvenile's parents unless daddy is black, then shoot him. Well, I was stunned. I'd never seen uh, such a uh, blatant uh, use of foul language coming from a sworn police officers. O'Connell found the messages so disturbing he immediately alerted prospects mayor. This guy's gone. I mean, he was suspended the day after the mayor got my letter. He, uh, they worked out some arrangement to get rid of him and he's gone. Shaw resigned late last year. Sources tell WDRB News the messages were uncovered when Shaw was investigated for interfering in the sex abuse probe of the Louisville Metro Police Explorer program. Shaw says he was cleared in that investigation, but because of the messages, 24 cases involving Shaw as an officer are expected to be dismissed. As far as further actions criminally, I'm not sure that uh, these have crossed that line in terms of cr criminal behavior. Although um, the effect it has on the criminal justice system, if this goes unnoticed and unchecked, is extraordinarily serious and could affect rights of a lot of people. Shaw argued that the messages were not politically correct and fought to keep them private, but a judge ruled they should be released under Kentucky's open records law. I hope he never shows his face in Jefferson County again. At the time, Shaw was also the acting police chief. O'Connell says Shaw's cases that will likely be dismissed are mostly traffic violations and lower level offenses. Valerie, have we heard from Shaw or his attorney at this point? Shaw has declined to comment. His attorneys have not returned our calls yet. Now, Shaw has resigned from the Prospect Police Department, but do we know if he has a job anywhere else in law enforcement? There's no word on what he is doing right now. Again, he's declined to comment, so he's not really saying anything about the case. He did have a 20-year career with LMPD before he joined the Prospect Department. 
what can you tell us about his alleged involvement with the Explorer sex abuse investigation that led to this explosive development? Well, one of the officers charged in the Explorer case is accused of asking Shaw to access the NCIC database to run license plates of undercover officers. Improperly accessing the database is a criminal offense. I'm not asking any exception to any rules. Yeah. But what I will tell you is I don't want to die in your cell. Fifteen hours later, Ralkina Jones would be found dead in her cell. I don't feel safe with him. She was arrested on charges of assault from earlier in the night in which this videotape allegedly shows her hitting her husband. You got the keys. She was taken to city jail where she laid out her prescriptions. Then in great, well thought out detail explained her medical history. All of it captured on police body cam. I hadn't had my medication then. One. Yeah. Two. I have a brain injury. My main concern is my POTS syndrome. That's a syndrome that triggers lightheadedness and fainting. With your health issues, it's easier to keep an eye on you here. Jail personnel gave her options, including a holding area where she could make calls. Little did any of them know her plea earlier in the night would prove tragically valid. I'm not asking any exception to any rule. Yeah. But what I will tell you is, I don't want to die in your city. Always get yourself a gun and stay strapped, my friends. Stay strapped. So I want to tell you a quick story. And I have a reason that I want to tell you a story, okay? And I want you to watch this whole video, okay? Because I'm going to point out specific types of moral and ethical corruption that are going on inside of our government right now and how government officials are siding with people who support their political ideology and giving them money okay so here's the deal this woman right here she works for multnomah county now i'm not exactly sure i'm pretty positive she is a probation officer and what she did is she sued multnomah county she sold multnomah county and was awarded one hundred thousand dollars one hundred thousand dollars because one of her fellow employees had a blue lives matter flag displayed in the office now here's the thing there was other types of things in the office apparently this woman from reports now i can't verify this from reports that she had black lives matter flags and that the blue lives matter flag offended her but here's what makes this even more interesting okay so this woman right here after this woman or person refused to take down, I believe it's a it's a man. I don't know if I think it's a man in this office refused to take down their Blue Lives Matter flag. She posted this giant mural of a lot of black people that have been killed. Um, so she is a Black Lives Matter activist. Now here's the thing that's interesting. She was awarded one hundred thousand dollars. Her lawsuit started in January. Now, there's links to all of this in the description below, and I'm going to show you what kind of ethical corruption we have going on and how you can actually fight back on this. So the original lawsuit was actually for $420,000. Okay, now this is Karima Guan Plajur versus Multnomah County. And the interesting thing is she actually cites the Charlotte's, Charlottesville, Virginia uh, protests and the fact that some of the people in Charlottesville, Charlottesville, Virginia displayed the thin blue line flag during their protest. And apparently that's the reason that she believes that the flag should not be displayed and it's an attack on her and, in, and that the Blue Lives Matter flag is in support of white supremacy. And one of the interesting things is, is even her own attorneys claimed that other co-workers who had hung similar Blue Lives Matter flags took down their flags after learning that they were offensive to some co-workers in the office. It just goes to show you how weak and pathetic people are becoming. And I support the person who refused to remove this flag. Now, apparently, this woman is no longer going to be working for Multnomah County. But listen to this. Their attorneys, her attorneys claim that the Black Lives Matter movement was started to call attention to the disproportionate policing and killing of black people by law enforcement. The Blue Lives Matter sign co-ops the racial justice movement slogan, repurposes it to shift focus to law enforcement, a chosen profession, not a racial identity, which doesn't stay, say anything. So it doesn't say anything. So 
racial identity versus chosen profession. So I don't understand how supporting a chosen profession over or in place of a racial identity even matters. But she says that this denigrates, dilutes, and demeans the purpose of the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, she won, she was given, given of the $420,000 she filed suit over. And by the way, feel free, the, the attorneys that gave away, that were that fought for her to get $100,000 taken away from the taxpayers are called Albie and Stark. And they're at 210 Southwest Morrison Street Feel free to contact them. They're clearly very good at what they do. I recommend getting a hold of them for, uh, you know, maybe some little racial justice services of your own if you have any. I wonder if they'd represent a white person. I'm not, I wonder, in, in, a, in a reverse type of scenario, right? I don't understand why the Blue Lives Matter person couldn't have filed a reverse suit in its place. It doesn't make any sense. It will clearly show a bias in favor of, a predisposition in favor of the woman who sued Multnomah County and was given, uh, and was given one hundred thousand dollars because of it. That's the problem that I have. Okay, you can't. That's not right. Because you know, being a being a proponent of Black Lives Matter is not a right. Okay. Well, excuse me. It is a right, but it. She. These people. What I'm trying to say is, these city officials, city officials, are supposed to avoid bias or favoritism and respect the cultural differences as part of decision making. And they didn't do that. They didn't do that in this case. People who support Blue Lives Matter and people who support Black Lives Matter come from two different cultural black backgrounds almost all the time. All the time. That's objectively true. And they ignored their own code of conduct. They should be removed. And living in fear of one of his neighbors. He says he's been harassed now for more than a year. And add to that, that neighbor says he's just simply gone way too far this time. Fox 5's Marina Morocco is here to start us off at 10. Marina. Yeah, and well, it's gone way beyond a feud between neighbors who say it's completely one-sided. They're fed up and believe their neighbor needs to be held accountable for wrecking their peace of mind. It's a 14-month-old hate crime. From the moment Dante and his family moved into their new market neighborhood, the harassment hasn't stopped. It's so bad. When I call 911, Within 10 seconds, the dispatcher cuts me off. I already know where you're calling about. Dante's next door neighbor, Sean Porter, a renter who has taken his First Amendment right to a whole nother level. His front yard becoming a public display of anger and rants, calling out the neighborhood's homeowners association, its board members by name, and even putting up their headshots. His latest antics, sarcastic references directed towards Frederick County Sheriff Jenkins. His mailbox is no longer there because one of the residents just freaking plowed it over. Warning, no trespassing. Violators will be shot. Survivors will be shot again. Neighbors allege Porter brandishes assault rifles on his windowsills in plain sight as a form of intimidation. He pulled a gun on some workers that were remodeling my bathroom because they parked in front of his house mistakenly thinking it was mine. Dante says the harassment is incessant with Porter dedicating a day to wave Confederate flags with the help of his middle school son for hours on end. He told his son, if you go to the playground and that black kid is there, you come home. Last week, Dante called the cops at 2.30 in the morning after he alleges Porter spent the night blaring music in the front yard. He's threatening, he's harassing, he's doing absolutely everything. Thursday night, he put my name on his truck, then it became a direct attack. For the last couple of weeks, deputies keep a round-the-clock watch, making sure tensions don't escalate. Tonight, Porter stopped by our live truck asking what we were doing. He allegedly calls me names and he harasses me. He calls the police about the way my car is parked in the middle of the night to wake me up on purpose. So well, he said that you rev your engine late into the night. No, I don't rev my car. engine late into the night. He's talking about kids in the neighborhood. It has nothing to do with me. Well, Neighbors say it was Porter who recently chased down a school bus in their neighborhood. Oh, God, he's getting off. Just wait. Terrorizing their children. It's a state law. You can't follow a bus. What about that time that you chased that school bus down? There was no time I chased a There's school a bus video. down. There's no chasing a school bus down. You were tailgating that Have a good day. No, I wasn't tailgating any bus. Have a good day. Otherwise, I would have been charged, wouldn't I? Well, Have I'll a good one. Take care. Thank you. My family in 2015 should not be subject to hate crime 
in 2015. It's absolutely ridiculous. I feel like I'm living in the 50s. I feel like I'm living in the 50s. Some want to remove Confederate statues, while others want to rename Robert E. Lee Park. But the threat posed by one supporter of the rebel flag is at the heart of a neighborhood turned upside down in Rosedale. ABC 2 News' Jeff Hager joins us right now with more on how this has led to violence, Jeff. <laughs> Jamie, the teenager in the middle of this isn't really flying the Confederate flag. He's wrapping himself in it and parading it up and down the street, which has led to a very uncivil war with his neighbors. Violence on the streets of Rosedale ends in an arrest after neighbors say a white man who had recently been toting a Confederate flag through the neighborhood leveled verbal threats at one of the lone black families here. And he was walking down the street and he stopped in front of T's house and said, F you, I'm going to kill you all. Witnesses say when some white neighbors confronted him, a fight ensued and a good Samaritan paid for it in blood. I tried to tell everybody to call the police and tell them to stop. The neighbor was already stopping, and I, I, then he, the guy came at me with the knife. How many stitches? Seven stitches. I was just protecting myself. Police arrested 18-year-old Brandon Harold on assault and weapons charges and later charged his father, Harry Harold, after he allegedly peeked in the windows of several victims. One of them is Sherlette Jackson, who captured these images of the flag-bearing teenager in front of her house a week earlier. Actually, when I took the picture, it was I was standing at my window, and he was standing right there. And he and then he kept doing it. Then he went and got his bite, and he was right up and down. Brandon's stepmother says it's the neighbors who are the real threats on this street. He's 18 years old, but he's, but he, he's more like a 14-year-old. As a special needs child. It was mine and his business. They jumped him. So I want justice to be done. As for the rebel flag, which also is featured prominently on his Facebook page, his family is offering up a historical defense. We're not prejudiced at all. It has something to do with his heritage, his people fighting the war to represent that flag. It has nothing to do with a hate crime. A judge released Brandon Harold on his own recognizance, which means the threat he poses, real or imagined, is very much on the minds of his neighbors. Maybe they're not taking it serious enough, and the only time it seems like people start taking things serious is when someone's dead. Running him over in an SUV in a racist attack learned his fate today. Today, a judge sentenced Russell Courtier to life in prison. He killed 19-year-old Larnell Bruce in Gresham back in 2016. Our Amy Frazier is live outside the Multnomah County Courthouse with reaction from the victim's family. Amy? Well, the victim's family says they feel a sense of relief. Their focus now is spreading love. 40-year-old Russell Courtier teared up during today's hearing, but the victim's family believes it was all for show. The judge says he was driven by hate and anger when he ran over and killed Larnell Bruce in August of 2016. It happened after a fight at a Gresham 7-Eleven. During the trial, the state presented evidence showing Courtier is a member of a white supremacist prison gang. He did not speak during his sentencing today. The victim's family met with us after the hearing surrounded by green balloons to promote organ donation. They say Bruce's organs helped save five people. As for the man now sentenced to life in prison, they say they hope he realizes how much they all have lost. Through this trial, my emotions were all over the place. It was. It wasn't until um, I took the time to realize what he lost too, that it made sense to me that it it wouldn't do me no good to to approach it angrily because that's what got us here to begin with. Courtier's girlfriend, Colleen Hunt, was also in the SUV when Bruce was murdered. She pled guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced today to 10 years in prison. Bruce's family tells us they're now starting a nonprofit organization to help other victims of hate crimes. We spend $1.2 trillion a year. The black community spends $1.2 trillion a year, but only 2% of that spending actually is spent in our community. 
So, I, you know, I ask people, imagine a country, $1.2 trillion is bigger than some countries in the world. So imagine a country that had a GDP of $1.2 trillion and only spent 2% of it in their country and the other 98% somewhere else you would know that that is going to be a poor country. The reality is that our community is building wealth in other communities and not amongst ourselves. If, we, if that 2% that we spent in our community moved to even 10%, we would create 1 million jobs in the black community. That, that's something we would do on our own with our own dollars. So the idea here is not just to bank black, but to buy black, to be black, to support the black community. Black dollars circulate in our community for only six hours. Like somebody gets paid, they go get a haircut, and then they go to another community and spend the rest of their money. Six hours. The Asian American community, their dollars circulate in their community for 28 days. Not 28 hours compared to our six hours, 28 days. The Jewish community, 19 days. So we're taking our dollars and not circulating it amongst ourselves. But if we do that, that's how we build wealth. This, this is really the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg. This is to increase our awareness, to increase our children's awareness of the power of our dollars. We have to be purposeful in terms of how we spend our money, how we save our money, what we do with our money. And so to say to the community, put $100 in one United Bank, Put a hundred dollars in the black owned bank. Go to oneunited.com and put a hundred dollars in the bank. First of all, it's still your hundred dollars. You didn't lose anything. You still have a hundred dollars in the bank. In fact, the interest we pay is higher than what you're getting at Bank of America. And you can do online banking and bill pay and all those kinds of things the same as you can do with Bank of America. You know, as Reverend Willis said, our ice is just as cold. But it's the, the, the key is not just the dollars that you put in One United Bank. It's the change of mind. It's a, it's a, this is a mind share issue. This is increasing our mind, our, the power of what we think about the power of our dollars.